Okay. All right. Uh, professor? Yeah? I was just wondering very quickly, is there a tentative set date for the midterm? Oh, good point. Um, I have a uh, time in my head. I have to, I just haven't, thank you for do, mentioning. Why don't you send me an email bugging me about that? Uh, I just have to, I haven't, I just have to check to make sure that it doesn't fall on like a holiday or something. Okay, sure thing. Thank you. I haven't done that yet. Um, that's a good, good point. Though. Are we having a discussion section this week or not this week? I think so. Uh, so you haven't heard anything from the TA yet? He hasn't uh, sent anything to you? I haven't seen anything. No, uh, Carl sent out an email yesterday. Yeah, his name is Carl Marth. So look look for the email from, uh, this is his name, Carl Marth. OK, thank you. OK. Um, Okay, guys, let's start. So uh, today the plan is to discuss um, many body physics, which is basically the quantum mechanics of, of multiple particles. And we want to discuss uh, symmetrization is, is sort of the big thing that we want to talk about, symmetrization. And you'll see what I mean as we go along, but that's the topic of today's discussion. Um, so, um, and, and can you guys hear me okay now? Is everything good? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah, and uh, I can hear you. Uh, um, and if you have a question, just interrupt me. You know, it's really fine to be to interrupt me. I'm, I'm totally okay with that. Because uh, I don't notice if you raise your hands and stuff. Just in interrupt me. Um, it, uh, in fact, it's even a desirable thing. Uh, Okay, so let's talk. So, so let's just remind ourselves about the quantum mechanics of one particle. Um, one particle, and I always like to use particle in a box as the as the example because really, every every potential is just like some kind of box, really, and so um, at least for confined states, um, and so you guys know that if I have some box then there's always going to be a ground state, first excited state, next excited state, and I, I get more nodes. So it's this very common progression of things, of states, eigenstates, that you guys all did last semester. And you guys know that the, the nth particle, the nth state for one particle uh, in one dimension is going to be square root of, uh, if this is of length L, zero to L, two over L sine uh, N pi over L X. And the energy is just gonna be kinetic energy, right? Over two M where KN is equal to N pi over L. Okay, so you guys all did that last semester. And this is the quantum mechanics of one particle bouncing around in that box, particle number one. Now, um, but now we wanna talk about the quantum mechanics of n particles. So now we have a box, but now we fill it with a bunch of particles and they're all bouncing around in there. There's another one bouncing like that. They're all going every which way, particle one, two, three, they all have names, little names, little numbers stamped on them, particle one, two, three, four, and five. They all have little numbers stamped on them. Uh, tattoos um, and so um, so now we so for this for the single particle case we to get this eigenstate we solved the Schrodinger equation h for the single particle eigen uh, Hamiltonian is equal to e n for the single particle state psi n and that's how we got this by solving the, the Schrodinger equation 
the time independent Schrodinger equation. And so now to understand what happens for n particles, we have to solve the Schrodinger equation again, only now it's a little different because now we have a many body Hamiltonian acting on a many body wave function. I'm trying to get this notation right. Uh, but then getting the subscripts and the superscripts confused. So we have a, a many body Hamiltonian acting on a many body wave function is equal to the, the energy of the many body state times the, uh, the wave function again. So this is the same, this is familiar. This is again, the Schrodinger equation. It doesn't change. So this should look normal to you. Just H psi equals E psi, but now we're doing many body states. But, but now the question is, how do we solve? Because if you have a system of many particles, this is the equation you gotta solve to figure out the eigen energy, you know, what are the allowed energies of my system and the eigen, the eigen energies and the eigenstates. You gotta solve this. This is the most important thing we do in, in quantum mechanics is we solve this stupid equation. That's it. That's like the biggest, hardest, most important part. So if we solve that equation, then that's gonna give us the many body wave function and it's going to give us the many body energies, which give which tell us a lot of physics. But how do we solve it? So um, that's the question. So now let's so let's solve it. So to solve, we first must find what Can you guess. Now I'm asked now to so shout out the answer if anybody knows. What do we have to find? What's the first thing we got to do? That's the question. To solve this equation, what's the first thing we have to find? Hamiltonian. Exactly, just like before. First have to find the many body Hamiltonian. Um, and so basically you guys know that the Hamiltonian is the energy, right? And so the many body Hamiltonian is just, you're just gonna add up the energies for all the particles, that's all. So it's pretty simple and straightforward. It's like not, you know, super fancy or sophisticated. You just add up the energies. Um, and, and it's classical. Remember, Hamiltonians always come from classical physics. So the quantum mechanics doesn't really start until you get, until you get the Hamiltonian. And the Hamiltonian always comes from classical physics. I'll just remind you that because it's easy to forget that classical physics, where it's not like we're throwing classical physics into the garbage can. We still use it to get the Hamiltonians, but once we have the Hamiltonian, then we throw the rest of classical physics into the garbage can. Um, there is no more F equals MA. Um, okay, so so to get the many body Hamiltonian, we have to ask the there's a there's a, a big question we have to ask. Big question. And the big question is: are the particles interacting? That's the big question. That's the huge question. And another way of asking that question is, do they feel each other? Do they feel each other? Because if they feel each other, if they feel each other, then we call that the interacting case. And if they, if they don't feel each other, They have no feelings. They're cold, mean little particles. Then uh, we call that the non-interacting case, um, or the, or we would say we would say then that the particles are independent. That's another word we like to use: independent particles. So these are two two different cases, and and so if we had. As an example, let's consider two particles. And the important thing is that if they're, for two particles, if they're interacting, then the potential of the two particles is gonna depend on the distance between them. Well, that's the distance between them. You see that? 
Does that make sense? Uh, I hope it does. Um, but if the particles are independent for two particles, then you can see that each particle might feel the potential landscape, the, you know, like the electromagnetic environment or whatever it is, but then they each feel it separately. And so I can put, I can draw the potent, the potential is a, is a function of one particle. And then it's the same function of the second particle. <clears throat> These are hugely different cases. And it turns out that for the interacting case, then this case is very hard to solve. Whereas the non-interacting -inter case is easy to solve. Relatively. Um, professor, can I ask yeah. a question? Um, so does this potential apply to both uh, identical particles and non-identical particles or does it only yeah. apply to? No, no, it applies to everybody, you know, because this is the way you should picture it is I have a box and this is the, this is the way to think about it. I just, I'm just throwing the particles into the box. I'm just throwing them in and they, and so they feel the potential of the box. So the box is the potential. The box, the box equals V. Box is potential. That's how you should think of it. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> okay. So now let's solve it. So what do we do? So let's, so of course we're gonna do the uh, non-interacting case <laughs> because the interacting case is just way too hard. The, the interacting case is sort of like what solid state physicists are studying, you know, like the theorists are trying to solve the situation for interacting particles. And that's like current research. Um, and then there's lots of interact, interesting stuff that happens, but let's do the non-interacting case, which is the easy case. And so the non -interact, for the non-interacting case, so basically what we want to do is we want to solve, you know, H psi equals E psi. That's, that's what we're trying to solve, but for the many body system, many body case for N particles. That's what, that's what we're solving. Uh, and so we write down the Hamiltonian. And so I can see that the Hamiltonian then is just gonna be the many body Hamiltonian. It's just gonna be the Hamiltonian for particle one plus the Hamiltonian for particle two plus the, et cetera. <clears throat> and so, because they're not interacting. And so the many body Hamiltonian will be the uh, kinetic energy of particle one Let's just assume the particles all have the same mass, just because otherwise the notation is just so too tedious, just too hard to write. So particle two has momentum. So we haven't, we're not getting into this identical particle stuff yet, but we will in just a few minutes. Um, and so we have all the kinetic energy. Okay, so we got the kinetic energy and now we got to write down the potential energy, V of X1, plus V of X2, plus blah, 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 V of Xn. So that's the case. So that's what the Hamiltonian looks like for the non-interacting case. Um, and so then what we wanna do then is um, <clears throat> we wanna take this Hamiltonian and we wanna hit it um, against some function, which is the many body uh, wave function which is going to be a function of the position of particle one, the position of particle two, position of particle n, and we want to solve this equation. <clears throat> Actually, I won't, let's, uh, oh yeah, maybe I will write that, just keep the notation. Uh, psi, many body. Okay, well, I guess I'll put an n here too, because it's the, there'll be a whole bunch of eigenstates. Okay, that's what we got to solve. And so, uh, uh, all right, well, how do we solve it? Uh, now, okay, so now it becomes a math problem. All right, now it becomes a math problem. It's just a, it's just a differential equation that we got to solve <clears throat> because we know what the Hamiltonian is, but what we don't know is this, this function. And, and of course, we don't know the, eigen, the eigenvalues either. So um, 
okay, uh, but we know the Hamiltonian. It's this, it's this thing, and we know that, and of course, uh, we know that each, uh, you know, p squared, uh, p sub i squared, we know what that is too. Um, it's going to be negative, uh, uh, negative h bar squared, um, del squared, right? Uh, okay, so um, okay, so uh, we know this, um, <clears throat> but how do? But now we got to solve this. So we know it's Hamiltonian, uh, but now uh, how do we solve it? So to solve this, we have to make an. We're going to um, use a mathematical technique, and we're going to make an assumption. And does anybody know what the assumption is? Separation of variables. Exactly. <clears throat> because whenever we have a differential equation, um, a partial differential equation with many variables in physics, and we're asked for trying to solve a partial differential equation, then we always start with um, uh, separation of variables. And you always do that because it's always easiest. It doesn't, sometimes it doesn't work. If it doesn't work, you're screwed. You got to do something different. But but if it works, then life is sweet. So let's just, let's try. So basically, we just and and it's hard to kind of know whether it's going to work or not. But let's just try it and see if it works. And you know, of course, it will it will work in this case. Um, the the reason it works is because uh, it, the reason it works is because um, I can write the potential as a sum like that. You know. That's why it's going to work. Uh, if I if 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 the potential had been some sum of like I don't know uh, v of you know x i minus x j you know where I had to worry about then uh, the the distance between them then it would not work. But it's going to work because the particles are independent. All right. So uh, so separation of variables. The whole point of separation of variables is that we make the assumption that the many body wave function, which is a function uh, of x1 and x2 and x3 and all these variables, we're going to make the assumption that it can be written as a, as a function um, of um, x, x1 times a function of x2, times a function of x3, blah, 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 to xn. So we're going to assume that we can write it as a product of different functions, where each function is uh, uh, a function of just one variable. OK? Um, and this is, the, this is meant to be the index. Uh, well, actually, I'm not going to. Get too caught up in that. Getting the indices all consistent is, is kind of hard. Um, okay, and so now what we're going to do then is is we got our we got our we've made our assumption of separation of variables, and then the next thing we do, once you have the function, then the next thing you do is you plug it in. Plug it in, and we plug it into h psi equals e psi. And so um, there's a lot of writing, but but let's but let's basically uh, just do it. So we we plug it in, and so um, the the Schrodinger equation becomes this: h is going to be this sum of uh, p squared i over two m um, uh, plus uh, v of x i, and uh, we're going to hit that. Up against. Yeah. Uh, for the side with the bar and without the bar, uh, they uh, are they uh, should should there be a bar it at each side equal to e side or are they referring to the individual uh, wave functions of each part? You mean when I write this? Uh, uh, I'm yeah. Should should there uh, is there a difference between the side with bar or without bar? Oh yeah, there certainly is. Because this is this is what we're solving. The Schrodinger equation is this. So I just am being sloppy because there's so much writing. Right? 
Does this answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. No, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, so this is what we're solving. And um, so now let's hit the many body wave function with the Hamiltonian. But now the many body wave function is going to be this um, product uh, psi one of x1 times psi two of x2. And it's a product all the way to psi n of xn. Okay. And this then is going to be equal to e. That, and this is the many body. I'm not going to write many body anymore because it's just so tedious. Well, I might occasionally write it, but um, it's this, this thing uh, times psi one of x1, psi two of x2, psi n of xn. Okay, so this is our equation that we have to solve. Uh, and we want to find all those all those functions. Now, um, and, re, and, and also remember that uh, pi squared over 2m is equal to negative h bar squared over 2m del squared i. Just so when I write pi squared, I want you to, you know, this is, you know, you got to remember that. But I just write pi squared just because it's easier, you know, it's just easier for me to write. It's so, so much writing. Okay, so, so this is what we do. And so uh, we're going to do the trick. So now we, we multiply this thing out. So this thing hits that. Uh, and, and now we're going to do the separation of variables trick. Does anybody remember what that trick is? There's like a, it's like the, what, what's next? Does anybody remember the separation of variables trick? Uh, I think then we divide by the product of all the size. Exactly. Both, both sides. Then, yeah. That's right. Then divide, exactly. Then divide both sides by the the uh, 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 the many body thing solution. Okay, so then we, when you do that, which is of course equal to this uh, product. Okay, so divide both sides by that, and when you do that, you're going to get this because this is going to be a, a sum from, from 1 to n. Um, and you're going to get uh, pi. Everything divides out. Everything divides out beautifully, except for the fact that this pi squared over 2m is an operator. And it's acting on psi i of uh, xi. And so that doesn't divide out. So that one, you, have, it, it, you, you run into a little problem there. It doesn't divide out, but everything else divides out because it's just being multiplied by, and you get this. And this should look familiar. You might not have seen this in the context of this particular problem, but you've seen this kind of thing before for other problems. So it should look reasonably familiar. And this is, and this is the constant, but we don't know what it is yet, constant. Uh, that's the, eigen, you know, the eigenvalue. Um, okay, and so we, we so now we have this equation, and we have this sum over all these different variables, and so now we do the second trick of separation of variables. We say that this is a sum over different variables, and when we make that sum, it's always constant. And how can that be? And is, can someone tell me the, the, the separation of variables trick that we invoke at this point? Um, each uh, individual function must itself be a constant? Yes, exactly. So each thing in the brackets here must itself, exactly as he said, be a constant. And we'll call it a, and, and, but all the constants can be different. So we'll call it little e sub i. And so then what we have is we have now E n is equal to the sum of these other constants. Okay. And can you guess what E i is? You probably can. Let me just let me just write it out. So what this leads us to then uh, um, now we have we go from one equation to now we have n equations. And each of those n equations looks like this. 
it looks like this, um, uh, pi squared over 2m acting on psi i of xi uh, divided by psi i of xi uh, plus e of xi is equal to epsilon i, right? That's what we did. But then we can rewrite this by just multiply by um, psi i xi. And then we get this equation, which should look very familiar. Pi squared over 2m psi i of xi um, plus, well, actually, let me, rewrite, let me write it a different way, a more uh, familiar way, uh, plus of xi psi i of xi is equal to it's just a very cute little thing psi i of xi and you have this and so does anybody recognize this and the one dimensional uh, time independent schrodinger equation exactly it's just the schrodinger equation for one particle it's exactly right so basically we see and and now you see what epsilon i is epsilon i is the energy of one particle energy of the ith particle and so um so so the beauty of it now is that you see that to get the many body wave function you just have to solve for the single particle wave functions. And so then that means then that we see that the many body wave function then, and we're basically done. The many body wave function for the nth state is just gonna be, or for, I won't put the n there just yet, but it, the, the many body wave function, the eigenstate, well, it is the nth state, uh, to, and is just equal to the product of the wave functions for particle one, x one, particle two, x two, particle three, etc. And and the energy, the many body energy, is is simply equal to the energy of particle one plus the energy of particle two plus the energy of particle three. Okay, so, so this then is something uh, really important. So this is a really important result because we see that the, um, it's a really important result because we see that it's, it, it is that the, the, the many body wave function is just the product of all the single particle wave function. And it, and it should sort of make sense probabilistically because you guys know that when you, you have multiple things and in probability, if I have like three particles, it's, and I say, what's the probability for this particle to be somewhere and at the same time, this particle, and at the same time, this particle, then whenever you have the word and you uh, multiply. So, so it's, a, it's a product. Uh, psi m many body is equal to a, a product state. And it makes sense, it should make sense probabilistically. And if it doesn't, you know, you should ask a question, product state. Um, okay. Um, and so there's a way to think about this. Like there's, so, so there's a really simple way to do it. Like, so this is just how people do it. Is if I have, let's put like three particles in a box, three particles in box. So here's my box. And if I put three particles in a box and I can say to you, what's the eigenstate of three particles in a box? Then what you do is, is there's many possible eigenstates, but what you first do is you solve for all the, what you first do is you solve for all the eigenstates of the box. And the box could be more complicated. You know, it could be some complicated box, but it's always the same procedure. You solve for all the eigenstates and I'll call this Psi, um, let's call this Psi A, Psi B, Psi C. So these are the eigenstates. And then you just throw the particles into the box. 
you throw the particles in and, and you can throw them in any way you want. Like you could throw them in, you could throw them in like this, one, two, three, or you could throw them in like this, one, two, three, or you could throw them in, you know, you could just throw them in any way you want. One, two, three. So let's pick, uh, let's pick uh, this one, just arbitrarily. We pick this one. We throw the three particles into the box, into these single particle states where this is state A, B, C. So I pick, let's pick this one. And then I can immediately see that the wave function of x1, x2, x3 is going to equal, uh, let's see, there's two particles in state A. So I'll call that psi A particle one, psi A particle two, and there's one particle in state B. So I'll call that psi B x3. Or I could have done this one, in which case it would be the many body state is equal to, let's see, that's A, B, C, psi A, X1, psi B, X2, psi B, X3. Okay, so th there's a simple pattern to it. And, and the energy, of course, of this first one, the energy will be, uh, this first one is gonna be, uh, energy A plus energy A plus energy B. And for this second one, it's gonna be energy equals what? What's the many body eigen energy for this state that I'm working on right now? Somebody tell me. Is the energy A plus energy B plus energy B? That's exactly right. Energy A plus twice energy B. Now, I know that in your mind, you're probably thinking, wait a second, what, how did I know which one was X1 and which one was X2, you know? <laughs> I did, because I, I could have, you know, I could have picked the numbers differently. And, and but let's not, let's not get caught up in that yet, but I do want to, but that's an issue. Uh, okay, but I, I, I want you, I want you to, to appreciate the simplicity of it, okay? Because it, it is very simple and there's really nothing more to it than, than that. And this is how people do it. Uh, so that's the simple, okay, so this is the simple stuff. Um, so the, the thing that I want you to appreciate is that for non-interacting particles, the many body wave function is a product state. And, and the energy is just the sum of all the individual energies. Okay, that's, that's the key message here that I want you to internalize. Okay, that's the easy part. So now let's do something tricky. Ha <laughs> ha, you know how it is with quantum mechanics. The easy parts, but there's always there's always the tricky parts. Now let's do something tricky. Uh, but tricky is also a synonym for interesting. You know, the tricky things are also sort of the more interesting things. So let's consider um, let's consider what happens when the particles are indistinguishable. Indistinguishable particles. And um, that means that they're identical. And of course, my favorite particle is the electron. So let's just consider a bunch of electrons um, as, an, as one example. Uh, and so then for indistinguishable particles, let's consider uh, n indistinguishable particles. I'm not going to write indistinguishable. It's a long word. I'm going to write and identical particles. Let's consider n identical particles. Uh, and so now, uh, what I can do is um, I can I can write down the um, Hamiltonian. So let's 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 just take a look at what it looks like visually. So I have a box. And I'm throwing the particles into the box. And let's say that I have, for example, four particles. Okay, and here they are. Um, and I'll just call them uh, one, two, three, four. Okay, like, like four particles. There they are, they're bouncing around in my box. 
they're indistinguishable, like like uh, electrons in an atom. That's what you should be thinking. Uh, and so now I should, this is like my atom. Uh, so now uh, let's write down the Hamiltonian. And my Hamiltonian is gonna be uh, P1 squared over 2M plus the momentum of the second particle plus the moment plus et cetera, the momentum of the nth particle. And then of course, there's gonna be the potential energy of all the particles. And I'm just writing it in this notation, but let's, let's assume, uh, let's, but let's, let's, let's keep assuming that we have the non-interacting case for, um, uh, um, well, actually, no, it, it doesn't, actually the, for these arguments, it, it, it's, we don't even need to have that restriction. So let's just assume that there's some potential between them and they could be interacting actually. So, um, okay. And so now um, what I can do then is the thing, okay, the thing to, I want you to appreciate that the particles are indistinguishable identical particles, but mathematically to write down the Hamiltonian, I have to distinguish them in my head. I have to put, I have to give them a stamp. Each particle has to get a stamp so that I can write down an equation for it. So, I'll, so the particles are stamped with these little numbers. They have little tattoos on them, particle one, two, three, and four. Um, but, but when I do a, but it, but you know that physically, if I was to remove those tattoos and then and then redo the tattoos, and you can do that now with lasers. Uh, then my sister used to do that for a living, uh, and so you can do tattoo removal and then get new tattoos. Uh, then what you, you know that if I was to uh, write down the, the Hamiltonian uh, for, um, or, or if I was to, if I was to uh, solve the Hamiltonian and, and have my, my, get my, I get my many body wave function. But if I was to just change the numbers on the particles, um, let's, let's just, draw them again, everything's the same. But if I was simply to swap the numbers, so now this is particle two, and this is particle one, and this is still particle three, and this is particle four, then you know that these two should have the same energy. And I'm just, um, what I'm doing is I'm just um, appealing to your intuition at this point, because it's sort of uh, intuitively obvious. I mean, if I have some system of, part of identical particles and I, I write down my Hamiltonian and I have my, my many body wave function, if I, if I simply swap any two indices, then it shouldn't really change, it should not change things, right? It should not change measurable quantities. There might be a phase, you know, there might be some phase shift somewhere, but not a, nothing measurable. It should not change measurable quantities because it's really the same system. Because like, if I have an atom and I, and I have four electrons in it and, and I call this electron, electron one, two, three, and four, and if I just change the names of the electrons, it doesn't change the physics. So I'm hoping that that's sort of obvious to you. If it's not, you know, ask a question or think about it, um, but it should not change measurable quantities. And so let's consider this, let's consider this concept of swapping indices. Swapping indices, it's a mathematical operation. And so we can, it's an, it's an operation, right? It's a mathematical, operation and so that means that we can represent it by an operator right of course and that operator will give it a name um p i j because it's uh it swaps the i and j particles p i j uh it swaps uh the i and J particles, it exchanges them. It exchanges them. 
And so because it exchanges them, we call it, what is the name of this operator? It is the what operator? Someone tell me. Exchange operator? Yes. Of course. So we call it the exchange operator, okay? Because it exchanges the names. Think of it as a, it's like the, the laser beam in the tattoo removal clinic, all right? That's what it does. It removes the tattoos and then it redoes the tattoos. It just swaps the indices. So it, ex it, it exchanges the indices. Okay, so that should make sense because I can write down an equation so I can always just change the labels on my equation. So even you might not have encountered this operator before, but in your mind, you can imagine that it's a reasonable thing to invent. Um, and so, for example, if I have uh, PIJ uh, acting on some many body wave function, which is X1, X2, XI, XJ, then it's going to be uh, equal to um, this x1, x2, xj, xi, which exchanges them. Uh, and that might seem very abstract to you at first, but let's just let's just be really clear. It's 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 a simple simple thing. When you look at the equations, it seems harder than it actually is. Like like let me give you an example. Suppose I just made up a many body wave function. Here's my many body wave function for two particles. X1, X2 is um, X1 uh, to the uh, fifth power at times X2 to the ninth power. Okay, that's my wave function. I, I know it's like a weird wave function, but whatever, it's, it could be a wave function um, times some constant to normalize it. So now if I act on this, with the operator, the exchange operator P12 on this many body wave function, then it becomes X2 to the fifth power times X1 to the ninth power. Okay, that's all. That's really true. It's a trivial thing. I'm just literally swapping the labels. So it just swaps or exchange the labels. That's all that it does. So there's nothing, nothing more than that. You know, it's, it's easy to think there's more going on, but there's not. There's really not much going on at all. Uh, and so, okay, so uh, so now it's an operator. So if Pij is an operator, then um, it can have eigenvalues, right? Why not? It can have eigenvalues and eigenstates. Why not? It's an operator. I can just do my little math trick, and 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 so let's. Uh, that's, so that means that there must exist, must exist eigenstates to this operator. And those eigenstates, if I, if I hit one of those eigenstates, PI, and let's assume that I have some eigenstate psi. If I hit my PIJ on my eigenstate psi, if that's an eigenstate, then that's gonna give me what, well, it's going to give me back my eigenstate multiplied by something. What? What does it get multiplied by? The eigenvalue. Exactly. By the rules of linear algebra. Exactly. The eigenvalue. Just not just simple math. Eigenvalue. And so then, so that's kind of cool. Uh, but then let's do it again. Let, but now there's something special about the exchange operator. Let's do it again. Let's hit it twice. Pij times Pij uh, on my many body wave function. And suppose this is the eigenstate. So that's going to be something times psi. What goes here? Lambda squared. Yes, of course. Good because if the opera, that's a constant, so the operator goes slides right through it, hits it again, get another lambda, exactly. Okay, good. So that makes sense. But now let's take a look at this thing. What is this? What happens if I hit, if I, if I take 
the exchange operator and hit it onto something twice, what does it give me? The original. Right. And that's exactly right. It is the, that's exactly right. It puts it back. But if it puts it back, that means that what, what, what then is this operator? That means that this operator PIJ times PIJ is another operator. What do I call that operator? Identity? Yes, it's the identity. Exactly. That's exactly right. It's the identity operator. And so we can just call it you know, one, the identity operator. And so that means then that lambda squared equals what? Plus or minus one. Right. Or that's, well, lambda squared is one, but but lambda then would be plus or minus one. That, that, I know that's what you meant, right? So, so lambda squared is one, but lambda then must be plus or minus one. So we have figured out the eigenvalues of PIJ. Eigenvalues of PIJ. Okay, so we're just doing math now and it's not too hard. You know, it's kind of fun because you can just kind of, it should sort of make sense. Even though it's this weird abstract quantity you might never have thought of before, you can sort of start playing with it and kind of piecing it around. Uh, uh, and so, um, okay. And so now let, let's, so, so let's, let's make a definition. So let's consider an eigenstate um, um, psi. A, this, and remember, this is a many body wave function, right? X1, X2, Xn. And let's hit it uh, with the exchange operator. And let's assume that this wave function has the funny property such that it, um, it is an eigenstate of the exchange operator. Um, and it has, um, uh, and, and the eigenvalue is one, okay? And I've exchanged um, the, the so it so that means that when I hit so let's so this so suppose now that this is an eigenstate of the exchange operator okay and it's the eigenstate that has the eigenvalue of one now this is a special kind of wave function and I'm going to give it a name I'm going to call it a symmetric I'm going to call it a symmetric state so um, so if psi is an eigenstate that of the exchange operator that has the eigenvalue one, then the name is, we say that psi is called a symmetric wave function, a symmetric many body wave function. And so we use the word symmetric. Now I'll be honest, I hate this name. The reason I hate this name is because the word symmetric is used in physics for so many things. You know, it's like, you know, you got mirror symmetry, rotational symmetry. I mean, there's so many things, you know, you can be symmetric for so many uh, different operators. Uh, I think it's sort of gratuitous and annoying that they use this word symmetric. I wish they could have come up with another word, you know, but they didn't, they call it symmetric. So uh, it is a little confusing because, you know, symmetric is the, so that word is used too often, but whatever. We'll call this a symmetric wave function. And you just have to understand that it's, it's in the context of the exchange operator, okay? Um, and by the same token, um, if I have a many body wave function such that it has the eigenvalue, such that it is an eigenstate of the exchange operator with eigenvalue negative one, then we say that that wave function is, can you guess? Say it, what do we call it? Anti-symmetric. Exactly. We call it anti-symmetric. So this is, these are just definitions, anti-symmetric in the context of the exchange operation, uh, in the context of many body wave functions. And so Pij, acting on the symmetric wave function is equal to the symmetric wave function, but Pij acting on 
the anti-symmetric wave function is equal to negative. It flips the sign of the anti-symmetric wave function. And these are many body wave functions, right? It's just, I just don't want to keep writing it. It's so, so tedious to keep writing. Okay, so these are just definitions. Um, and let's keep going. Uh, and so here's an interesting, cute little thing. Let's notice, let's notice something cute. Well, let's ask ourselves, well, we can, we, let's ask a question. The question is, does the exchange operator commute with the Hamiltonian? And this Hamiltonian, of course, is the many body Hamiltonian. And intuitively, you should know the answer because I just, I just said a few minutes ago that if I take identical particles and I just swap their labels, then I should not change any measurable quantity. Is energy a measurable quantity, yes or no? Yeah. It is, yeah. right. And so swapping the labels on some particles should not change their energy. And so, it, and so intuitively you should know then that if I swap the labels and it doesn't change the energy, then that sort of implies, well, that PIJ commutes with the Hamiltonian just intuitively. But, but that's not enough, you know, because sometimes your intuition can be wrong, you know, as you get older that you, you have many examples where that has happened in your life, I'm sure, uh, and there'll be many more. Uh, and so, you know, that's true. So let's prove it. Let's, let's, let's find out. Does it, it, it does it commute? Let's, let's figure it out. So what we do is we take the Hamiltonian, the many body Hamiltonian, and we multiply it times the exchange operator, and we multiply that times what? Someone tell me. Something comes here, what? Psi. Yeah, a many body wave function, that's exactly right. Because it has to act on something. And let's look at that. So now what we do is <clears throat> we see, and let's, let's assume that this is a, an eigenstate such that let's assume that we have some eigenstate such that then I know that this is gonna be E n times psi n many body. Okay, so that means then that this is gonna be, so that means I can put this around it. And so by swapping i and j in that many body wave function for, and we're talking about indistinguishable particles, is that gonna change the eigenvalue of that wave function if it's an eigenfunction, yes or no? No. Oh, it might. No. no. What's no. that? Right, it cannot change the energy, right? Yeah. Because, because if, a, if a many body wave function, if I, if I'm in eigenstate, like these are eigenstates, if I'm in an eigenstate, then that means that my energy is well-defined. If I'm in an energy eigenstate, and I just told you if by swapping the labels for identical particles, I cannot change the energy, that's a measurable quantity. And so if I hit an eigenstate, a many body eigenstate of indistinguishable particles with the exchange operator, can it change the eigenstate, the eigenenergy of that state, yes or no? That's right, it cannot change the eigenenergy. So, so that means that H acting on this has to be En times Pij psi N. Okay, and, and then that means then that I can, um, since that's a constant, I can bring it in, right? And so that's equal to Pij times En psi n, but if this is an eigenstate, then I can replace that with h, right? And so this is equal to pij h psi n, anybody? Okay, so I just proved it. So I got h times pij is equal to pij times h. Okay, so, so I've just proved, therefore, um, the commutator between Pij and H, the many body Hamiltonian equals zero. Yay, that's very useful. 
Uh, it's, it's sort of an obvious thing, but it's still nice to prove. Um, and so the reason why that is, one of the reasons why that's useful is because that means then that if I have any state, then if I, it, that means that if I have any state, remember, I could look at the expectation of Pij. And I'll remind you what expectation values are. That just, that's just taking the many body wave function and sandwiching it like this, right? So this is the expectation value of the exchange operator, because if I have an operator in quantum mechanics, I can always find the expectation value, right? That's the expectation value. This is shorthand for expectation value, expectation value. And you guys should remember that from last semester. And so that means that if I have some state and I find the expectation value, sometimes we do this, like we put a little subscript there side to remind us that it's the expectation value of that state. So that means that if I have some many body state and I calculate the expectation value, then now I will ask the question, does the expectation value change with time? Does it answer that question? Work it all out in your head. Do a proof. Do some quantum mechanics in your head. Tell me the answer. Zero. Um, as long as the operators themselves don't depend on time, it will be zero. Yeah, exactly. Because this is a, the, it, right. Again, two of you guys said that, and that's correct. Because this is a thing that you guys remember from last semester. If an operator commutes with the Hamiltonian, then the expectation value of the, then the time depend, then the time derivative of the expectation value of that operator is zero. And you learned that last semester, you proved it. And if you didn't prove it, and if that doesn't sound familiar, go back and look it up and prove it to yourself, because this is like one of the fundamental important results of quantum mechanics. And, and it's typically covered in 137A. So I'm assuming you all have seen this derivation. So if, if something commutes with the Hamiltonian, that means it's the time dependence of the expectation value is zero. And that's just another way of saying that this quantity, if, if something doesn't, if a quantity doesn't change in time, then that means that it is a, we, it is a blank quantity. There's a special word that we use in physics. What is it? Stationary it's state? Oh. It is a stationary state, but it is a what quantity? I think someone said it. Conserved quantity? Exactly. In the usual sense of conserved in physics, like we say energy is conserved, momentum is conserved. That means that these are things that don't change. These are quantities that don't change. So those quantities, if they don't change, that means that those quantities are represented by operators that commute with the Hamiltonian. So that means that the expectation value of the exchange operator is a conserved quantity. It does not change with time. So. That is significant because what that means is that if, if I have some many body state and it has uh, some, let's say it's an eigenstate uh, of, 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 of the um, exchange operator, right? That means then that that, that uh, eigenvalue is a, is, a, is a conserved quantity. So it, so lambda, doesn't change with time. So that means it's that means that the many body state is stamped with that value. The, the state has that value and never changes. It's a conserved quantity. Okay. Now let's uh, now let's do a cute little thing. Now let's let's note Professor, now let's yeah. Um I just have a quick question at night. Um uh, uh, about the um about conserved quantities. Um, so, um, can we extend this to also say that any um, any operator which commutes with an op uh, operator corresponding to a conserved quantity is also an operator of a conserved quantity? I don't think so. Uh, I think that, I mean, the, the theorem is simply, I mean, the theorem that I know, which is the same one that you guys learned last semester, is that if a quantity if an operator commutes with the Hamiltonian, then the expectation value of that operator is zero. It's a conserved quantity. Now, 
if some other operator commutes with that operator, then I don't know, you know, all bets are off. Uh, yeah, does, does that make sense? Yeah, that makes okay. sense, yeah. Right. Okay, so uh, now we're gonna notice something. Um, we're gonna notice something really cute. Uh, let's, let's just notice something really cute. Uh, let's, let's, take, let's take an arbitrary, let's take an arbitrary many body wave function. Not necessarily an eigenstate, it's arbitrary, okay? And now uh, let's hit it with the exchange operator. Now, now we know that it doesn't, it, it, it gives us back a many body state. Um, and and th that state has to be, um, uh, that state has to be normalized. Uh, and so it's gonna, I'm gonna get some, something here. And so it can't change any physical quantities. And so what, what, what can this be, this constant in front? Um, in order, because no, no physical quantities can change. No physical quantities can change, but the, um, but the wave function itself could change. So if I have a wave function and I do something to that wave function, but, it, but I'm not changing the physics of the wave function, but I still might change the wave function, what changes for the wave function? And you've encountered this before. Can you guess? I guess there would be a phase shift. Exactly. E to the I alpha. That's exactly right. I can, I can phase shift it. But now let's do it again. Let's hit it again, PIJ squared. And this is an arbitrary wave function. And so now this, what, what, what goes, now what, what do I get? In here, somebody tell me. <clears throat> one. Right. I'm gonna get one, but but uh, eventually you're right. But but if I'm gonna, but I hit it, uh, I hit it one time. I get e to the i alpha, and if I hit it again, what am I gonna get? E to the i alpha plus beta, probably. Well, uh, but each time I hit it, I get e to the i alpha because the pi oh, j goes okay. e to the i two alpha. Exactly e to the i2 alpha. But the other guy was right also who spoke up because he said that I know that pij squared doubled, pij doubled is going to be, is giving me the identity operator, right? Which is, it's just going to be one, which is equivalent to one. And so that means then that e to the i2 alpha equals one. And that means that two alpha is equal to what? Somebody tell me. Zero. Yeah, uh, that works, but what else? Uh, two n pi. Pi. Exactly. Yeah. Two n pi, which and zero is, is, is one of them. Yeah, n equals zero, one, two, all the integers. That's right. And so that means that alpha is equal to n pi. Um, and so, but what, but, uh, but that means that if, if N is even, then, um, then this, then what I have is, um, then E to the I alpha is equal to what? If N is even? Somebody tell me. One. Uh, close. <laughs> That was close. Try again. Oh, no, it's not close, it was right. Sorry, that was my mistake. If n is even, then it's one, sorry. I made that mistake and that's exactly right. And if it's odd, e to the i alpha is what? A minus one. Exactly. And so what this is telling us is that, look, any state that I hit, any arbitrary many body wave function that I hit with the exchange operator has this property. So what that is telling me is that every many body wave function, every physical many body wave function has to be 
a what? Can you get? Can you make the next step in logic? Every physical be, yes. Um, does it have to be symmetric or disymmetric? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So what we learn from this is that every physical many body wave function is an eigenstate of the exchange operator. And that means it's either um, symmetric, in which case the uh, eigenvalue is one, or it's anti-symmetric. The eigenvalue is minus one. So every many body wave function is either symmetric or anti-symmetric. It's, it's an eigenstate of the exchange operator. That's kind of cute. And so that, and so that was pretty straightforward. I mean, you know, we went through this logic, it's pretty straightforward. But now, um, so that's the easy part. So let's write this as a fundamental fact. Fundamental physical fact. And the fundamental yeah, fact, yeah. Could, could you explain what you mean by physical wave function really quick? Yeah, the reason why I use that word physical is because for a physical wave function, for identical particles, if I exchange the labels, I should not change the physics. Where the physics, and what is physics? Physics, when I say uh, physics is, um, what is physics? Physics is, I have operators, and let, let's, let's just say I have some operator Q, then physics means my expectation values, of, because these are the, what, do you, what can you measure? I have a physical system, I have, a, I have an operator Q and I have a wave function psi, what is physics? Physics is expectation values, what else? Physics is also matrix elements. The transition from psi A to psi B. That pretty much sums up physics, or at least all the physics that I know. Physics is basically just a bunch of expectation values and matrix elements. That's that's pretty much <laughs> everything. Uh, and so and so the point is is that if I exchange two labels on a many-body wave function of indistinguishable particles, then I do not change the expectation value. And I do not change matrix elements, but for that to be true, that means that 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 means that the exchange operator should only change the phase of the wave function. Does that make sense? Yes, I think that makes sense. Okay, that's the chain of logic. <clears throat> so the chain, so the chain of logic. Okay, so now, so it's a fundamental fact that um, um, if so, let's consider um, many body system of identical particles, anybody system of identical particles. Then, then the, the, the fundamental fact number one is that the, uh, the many body wave function must always be either symmetric or anti symmetric, must always be either symmetric or anti-symmetric, okay? And that was, and that's the easy part, okay? That, that's the one that you can actually understand from the discussion that we just had. But now let's do the hard part. There's another fundamental fact, fact number two, which is that, <clears throat> and this is the one that's not, that's not obvious, but let's just write it down. Uh, if I have um, systems, of identical particles with uh, spin equals an integer must have uh, that their many body wave function is can you can you guess? 
Do you know the answer? You, some of you probably know this. Can you guess what I'm about to say? It must be symmetric. Yes. Exactly. Pij psi is equal to plus psi. Whereas systems of identical particles with S is equal to a half integer must have psi many body is what, can you guess? Must be what, exactly. Um, professor, uh, is S here the spin of each particle or? Yes, Okay. that's right. The spin of each part, yes, that's right. <clears throat> because it's a system of identical particles <clears throat> and S is the, is the spin of each particle. Not the total spin, spin of each particle. So PIJ, that was a, that's a good question, um, was minus sign. Where this is the spin of each particle. Okay, and this one is, I'm gonna replace the word easy with the word sort of obvious. And when I say obvious, it's like obvious after you go through the kind of logic that we just went through in this court in this class. But this one is, I would say, these are not obvious. You know, like how do we connect the spin to the symmetry of the many body wave function? See, S equals half integer, S equals integer. So basically, this, and we call this the spin statistics theorem. And you'll see what I mean by statistics. In fact, you might already know from other classes. This is called the spin statistics theorem. And in my opinion, it's not obvious. Maybe to some smarter person, it is obvious, but to me, it's not obvious. Like the, this connection between spin and the symmetry of the many body wave function is not obvious. It comes from, and the reason it's not obvious is it comes from uh, quantum field theory. If you know quantum field theory, and I am really lame at quantum field theory. Uh, it's not something that I use in my world because I'm, I'm an experimentalist. Uh, but if you're good at quantum field theory, then this is a result from quantum field theory, okay? And so you guys, if you take quantum field theory, then you will see this derived, uh, but I cannot derive it uh, here or, or anywhere else for that matter. <laughs> so, okay, so the particles, uh, identical particles with integer spin, they have a name, what do we call them? Bosons. Bosons. Yes, we call these particles bosons. And the ones with half integer spin, we call them what? Fermions. That's right. And so this is a big deal. This fact that the many body wave function must be symmetrized has, has huge consequences. That's very important. And it really, and when I say huge consequences, I'm an experimentalist. And so when I say something has huge consequences, what I mean is it really affects what we measure and see in our experiments which is really the most important thing of all, right? So it's just some weird abstract concept that, you know, you can't measure, who cares? But if it's something that, you know, affects what you measure, then that has huge consequences. So, uh, so. Professor? Yeah. Uh, when we talk about uh, identical particles, are we assuming that they're all in the same spin state or that they're all just have the same spin? Like, are they all spin up electrons? No, we're not making that assumption. We're making the assumption that, you know, every particle, you know, if they're identical particles, each of them is stamped with the little s eigenvalue. Remember the spin eigenstate is sm. And so when I say the spin, it's this one. That's the one that is the spin. This one is the z component of the spin, okay? So when I say the spin of a particle, I'm talking about this eigenstate, okay, or this eigenvalue. So, so here's three electrons and each of them is stamped. They might have their spins pointing in funny directions. You know, this one might be up, this one might be down, this one might be half up. 
and half down, right? They can be in some weird superposition, but uh, they all have the same S. So the M eigenstate can change, but the S eigenstate never changes. So for electrons, they all have S equals what? One half. And so they all must be what? Either spin fermions. up or spin down. That's fermions. correct. And are they fermions or bosons? Fermions. fermions. Right. And it doesn't matter which way the spins are pointing. All right. So uh, let's keep going with that. Uh, and so let's understand some consequences of this idea. And um, let's, um, okay. So let's consider two particles. Consider two particles. And if I have two particles, then let's two identical particles, identical. Well, no, not identical yet. Let's, let's just consider two particles. So let's throw them in a box. So here's a box. And this box has states A, B, and C, right? And, this, and so then I have two particles and let's throw them in the box and, up, and, and let's construct the many body wave function. So let's throw the particles into the box like this. One particle goes in state A and one particle goes in state B. So now, according to what we did in the first part of this lecture, tell me the many body wave function. Psi many body of X1 and X2 is equal to what? Uh, psi yes. A of uh, X1 times Psi B of X2? Yes, perfect, thank you. So simple, and the energy of course is what? Um, uh, e, e A plus E. Yes, exactly. Um, and so now you know what these wave functions look like, right? They're different functions, right? The first one looks like that. The second one looks like that. The third one looks like that, like that, right? They look different. So I'm going to ask you, so is this a symmetric, is it symmetrized? And this is the word we use. Is it symmetrized? Now, when I say is something symmetrized, then what I'm saying is, is it either symmetric or anti-symmetric? Because something that is symmetrized means that it's either symmetric or anti-symmetric. So is it symmetrized? So that's basically what I'm saying is, is it an eigenstate of the exchange operator? So let's act on it with the exchange. There's only two particles. So the exchange operator will be P12. And Okay, so I have psi AX1, psi BX2. So I act now with the exchange operator. And what is it now? It's going to be psi A of what? X2. And psi B of what? X1. Yes. And now I'm just going to ask you, are these related by either a plus one or a minus one? Yes or no? And this is a math question. I'm not, this is, I'm not asking you a physics question. Like you could answer this question if you didn't know any physics. This is purely math. This is a function like this psi AX1 is like sine, um, what the hell? A, A is gonna be uh, what? Uh, n pi over l it's going to be uh, pi over l x1 and this one is going to be b is going to be sine these are functions pi this is going to be 2 pi over l x2 like the, and so now and this one here is going to be psi a x2 is going to be sine you know it's a math question x2 and this is going to be sine pi, 2 pi over L X1. So is this product the same as this product? It's a math question, yes or no? No, no. That's right. And so now I'll ask you another question. Is this a physical wave function? No. Correct. So that means in nature, this could not happen. Ho oh, <laughs> ho, isn't that a trip? 
it could not happen. So this is an unphysical wave function for identical particles. If they're not identical for, uh, for, I, for identical particles. Now, if the particles were not identical, and what I mean by that is if they're different particles, like one is an electron and one is a muon. If the particles are not identical, they're different types of particles. Is this a physical state for not identical particles? Yes or no? Yes. Correct. That's right. Because all of this uh, spin statistics stuff only applies to identical particles. See, this is a many body system of identical particles. But if they're not identical, it all goes out the window. So this, so this is a physical state for not for, and when those particles are not identical, we call them distinguishable. So this is physical. So this, so psi equals uh, psi A X1 times psi B X2 is physical for distinguishable particles, but it's unphysical for indistinguishable. And so the question then is, how do we make physical states? How do, so then how do we make it physical? How make it, how do we make it physical? Well, let's just do, let's just do a math trick. If I, I had, so let's start with this, this two particle state, X1, X2, the one we just did, which is psi A of X1 and psi B of X2. And, and that's not physical for distinguishable particles, but let's, let's do a math trick. Let me do this. Let's add psi A of X2 times psi B of X1. Okay, I just add that. So now I'm adding these two weird superpositions. Now let's do this, P12 of psi X1, X2. And now let's let's do the little thing. So now let's let's swap them. A, this will be X2, psi B, X1. And this one on the right is going to be psi A, X1, psi B, X2. Okay, now what can I say about these two situations? Are they the same or are they not the same? Somebody tell me. Same. The same? Right. So is this a physical state? Yes. Yep. Exactly. And is it symmetric or anti-symmetric? Symmetric. Symmetric. Exactly. So that's a symmetric state. I'll put a little S there. So this is physical. And then we're just about to end, but let me just do one other one. Let's consider another superposition where I did this, X1, X2. And let's suppose I did a different super weird little product super superposition of product states. Let's do this. Now let's put a minus sign here. Psi A, X2, Psi B, X1. Now let's hit it with the exchange operator. And now what I'm gonna get is Psi A, X2, Psi B, X1, minus Psi A, X1. Psi B X two. Are these states related? How are they related? By minus anti-symmetric. Right. They're related by a minus sign. Exactly. So is this a physical state? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And it's anti-symmetric. So if I look at these two states, if I have two, so if I had two electrons. Could two electrons live in this state that I just hit with my arrow? Could they? Two electrons. No. That's right. Mm -hmm. But could they live in this state? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So that's where we'll stop. Um, and uh, 
So I'm going to end the recording now, and then I'm going to have my office hour. So you guys, uh, um, you know, so some of you can, you know, so so click back in. You know, take me a couple of minutes to sort of end the recording and, and all that. But then I'll I'll start back up again in just like two or three minutes. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you. All right.